Alrighty, so match week number 15 is in the books, and today I'm actually only going to do the review of the 10 games that happened yesterday, and then tomorrow uh, I will do the review of the 4 games that happened today on Sunday, uh, because you know, there's no way I'm going to do a review, review of all 14 games at once, because that's going to be a really long, long video, and you know... You know, I don't want to do do a super long video where... I know these reviews are already like 60 plus minute, but, you know, if I do like 14 games, it's going to be almost near two hours, and you know no one want to watch a two-hour YouTube video. But in terms of these games that ha happen in match week number 15, well, if you like goals, this week was definitely not the week for you. And even though we didn't have any game that finished nil-nil out of these 14 games... Uh, no team was able to score more than two goals in all 14 of these games. And, you know, I guess a lot of that has to do with most of these teams having played in three weeks because of the June international break. And that match fitness and match sharpness was definitely lacking in some of these games, which also kind of produced some very surprising result, especially the, the result that happened today that we'll definitely talk, talk about tomorrow. But let us begin with the first match. Which is, for many people, we're saying a preview of the Western Conference Final between the Seattle Sounders versus LAFC. And there's no doubt that I, I know this could be a matchup that we could see in the playoffs. Because it feels like, for the last couple of years, this has always been a matchup that we've seen in the playoffs before. But, you know, when we take a look how this game plays out, it looks like both of these teams are ready to, to face off against each other in the playoffs. Because this was a very kind of pl playoff type of game where, you know... There were a couple of decent chances for both of these teams. It was very evenly played out. And that, you know, I know even though this is a matchup we've seen seen before. And sometimes when you wa watch a, a matchup that has happened over and over again in the playoffs. It can be a little bit, bit fatiguing. It can be a little bit tired out for fans that want to see a new matchup in the playoffs. But if, after the way that both of these teams played. Sign me up for a Seattle Sounders versus LAFC Western Conference playoff game in the near future now in the first half uh, Arango hits it wide from close range before Morris missed wide from long range as there was a couple of half chances early in these game but neither of these team tests the goalkeeper uh Ladero then puts it wide from 10 yards out before Fry uh made the first big big save by either of these goalkeeper denying Opoku from from the the far post uh Rodan then hit hit a weak one that goes straight to Crepo before Sefuntes hits one straight to Fry and you know again this game it felt Felt like a playoff game with the way that, yes, there were times that it was a little bit, bit cagey, but there's also times where both of these teams are trying their best in term, terms of creating chances. And that, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what playoff game is all about. You're going to see playoff games where, you know, it's going to be even for most of the time, especially in the later rounds where it's going to be even and a little bit cagey in some of these games. But you know that there's going to be chances for both of these teams and that both of these teams that have been really good throughout the season especially on the attacking end, is going to, to shine through. Uh, though in the 39th minute, Rusnak did puts it over the bar from 10 yards out before Fry had to make another save, this time denying Maswaski uh, with an unconventional kick save there. I mean, it's not often you see a goalkeeper make a save with his feet, but that's kind of what Stefan Fry did in this this play, and it kind of worked out for, for him, even though it was very unconventional. But we do head to halftime scoreless, despite the fact that there were some decent chances for both uh, of these team now in the second half uh Rusnak did fire one one straight to create pole in the 47 minute i thought the sounders actually come out as the stronger side i mean up to that point it was a very even game like you know there wasn't really any any momentum that either of these team has gained because of how even it is but the start of the second half i thought the sounders started to take control of the game and they were rewarded where they go in the 58th minute as albert Rusnak would get on the score sheet here though you might want to thank Maxine Crepo for for assisting him this goal because yeah for Crepo this was an absolute gift like he literally just played it right down broad Broadway with this with this uh, goal kick clearance and it goes right into to the path of Rusnak who puts it to the way to give the Sounders a one nothing lead and this also won't be the last time we're gonna see a bad goalkeeping mistake that that happened this week in fact there was a couple of goalkeeping mistake as it is the tradition with the way that it feels like every single week we do have a goalkeeping howler or a goalkeeping mistake throughout some some of these game and yeah this is definitely one that crepo would not want to to look back but uh, in the 60th minute ladero tried to double the the lead for the sounders but he hits that one straight to crepo the momentum was with the sounders and you know 
you know, they were getting majority of the chances in the second half. But as soon as I wrote that, uh, Fry had to make a double save, robbing Holland's head and Arango on the same attacking sequence. Just to show you that, you know, just because you, you dominate a game, when you do face against a good team, you can easily get sucker punch. And the Sounders almost got sucker punch with LAFC almost scoring against the run of play. Though we then started to enter a period where the game kind of become, become a little bit tight again. And there was not much chances that was created by either team but that was exactly what the sounders want to do they don't want to slow down the game they don't want to get into an open game with lafc though that being said in the 79th minute lafc did find the equalizer and it's chicho arango that ties the game up at one apiece because you know people forget that arango is a very underrated number nine nine in the league and he does does a good Good job here to basically put a looping header over the, the head of Ste Stefan Fry. Well, actually not over the head of Stefan Fry. I mean, Fry did kind of have to scramble, but he, he knew he was beat as he was scrambling trying to, to save that. But yeah, that ties the game up at one apiece. And as time winds down, you know, things continue to be a very choppy. And it feels like both of these teams were just kind of settling for for a draw. I mean, there was a lot of fouls, a lot of sloppy passes, and lack of flow from both of these these team and it almost felt like both of these teams were kind of scared playing scare a little bit not not wanted to lose this game because of how highly intensive this game game was and it also goes back to the whole playoff kind of feeling where you know usually as we get late into the game and especially with the single elimination you usually see games games late being very sloppy and very cho choppy because neither of these teams want to give up a goal they want it to just pl play this out and then maybe settle it in extra time or even go all the way to a PK shootout. But in the six-minute stoppage time, Madronda had one last chance of the game as he puts one right to Crepo. And yeah, in the end, it ends in a 1-1 draw. And the shots in this one, 13 shots committed, 11 that LAFC had. Five shots on goal for the seven that LAFC had. Six shots off target for the three that LAFC had. Two shots that was blocked for the one that LAFC had. And possession-wise, 53% possession compared to 47% possession that LAFC has in this game. And again, overall, I think the results are pretty much match how this game is. I think both of these teams deserve a point of a very hard, uh, hardly, uh, very hard fought game between both of these teams. And like I said, you know, I don't mind seeing both of these teams play against e each other in the the playoffs. Even though I know some people that you know if they want want some new new matchup in the playoffs. A lot of people would be totally against the fact that they want to see another Seattle versus LAFC kind of matchup. But now moving on in terms of the next match is the Galaxy and the Portland Timbers. And the Timbers, it looked like they were on their way of a massive three points on the road to really get themselves dig out of, their, out of this, this slow start they had in the beginning of the season. And then they decided to go back to 2020 Portland Tim Timber style, which is they just could not able to hold on to lead and could not able to, to close out a game without giving up a go goal late in one. I mean, I did. I know I promised not to kind of keep mentioning that with the t with the Timbers because you know I know I mentioned that a lot la last year and I thought last year they did a much better job in terms of closing out game and not giving up those late goals but yeah I mean it feels like this was just one of those those games that was kind of similar in in terms of the 2020 Portland Timbers season where it's just they just constantly give it up up goals late in the game to either drop points or drop all three points and in this case they they drop drop points on the road where they they desperately need a need a road win to get themselves some some momentum uh after going still going through the slow start now uh in the first half and by the way i did not watch the first 30 minutes of this this first half because as it is the the case espn decided to show show a blowout out college world series game instead uh, of this one i think they were showing uh stanford versus arkansas in in the in the college world series and the game was like something like 11 to 1 heading into the eighth inning and i get that ratings in in mls on espn is not very very good and that i'm pretty sure if they actually switch to to mls game on espn and pretty much put that college world series to to another channel i'm pretty sure a lot lot of the espn loyalists will not be happy uh, about that but this also is just another another example of why i am so glad that apple tv is going to take over the rights ne next year because this is going to be something that hopefully it's not going to be a, a problem because i know uh ne next year apple tv will basically have all the rights in terms of these games and even though espn occasionally will broadcast some of these national te televised game 
it is still going to be coming from the Apple TV feed. So if there's a situation where we can, where we have like like ESPN decided to to show show some something that 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 is just or decided to broadcast something that kind of kind of run a little bit late and they decide to not show a, a an MLS game. We don't have that issue starting next year with us just jump right into watching a stream on Apple TV until maybe ESPN decide, decided to switch back to the actual game. But as of now, it still feels like we're still dealing with this frustrating thing. And originally they said that the game was supposed to be on ESPN News. Uh, yeah, no, it was not on ESPN News. Like when I check on ESPN News on a knockoff stream, they were showing F1 kind of qualifying find that is going on so yeah uh, that's that's a double double will win me in terms of the the espn network where not only the fact that they decide not to show us this game because they they want to show a blowout college world series game but they blatantly lied to us the fact that it's going to show on another channel when it was clearly not not the case so that being said you know because i didn't see the first 30 minutes we start the notes in the 30 for first minute uh with edwards flash one just wide from the free kick now the good news is there was no goal to report in the first 30 minutes i mean if there was a goal that was report i guess i'll i'll find out later they're watching like a small clip of highlights to see 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 how that goal of course was scored but uh fast forward for into the 36 minutes zuberich did heads it high from from close range before in the 37 minute chicharito just missed a tapped in from the right side and he definitely wants to have that one back because that was prime chicharito uh position and this also won't be the last time that chicharito would miss a a sitter and one that you always think that he you, you should be able to put away being a poacher that that he he is in terms of his playing style but then just one minutes later you know i talked about that chicharito miss turns out to be a big miss well it turns out to be even a bigger miss for the galaxy because literally on the next attacking sequence jimmy charles would score from blanco to to tie the game up at, at, or actually not tie the game up, but give the Timbers a one nothing lead, and that was just a bread and butter play that the Timbers decided to do, which is go on the count attack, go on the the transition, and they did an absolutely amazing job in terms of it, that and finish off with with a goal. I mean, we haven't seen a lot a lot of that from the Portland Timbers this season of them scoring goals coming off of the counter attack, but that's also something that they they can still still do do, and that this was a prime example of that getting themselves a one nothing lead heading into halftime. But as we go to halftime with the Timbers leading one nothing and heading into the second half, uh, Grindseer did curl one just wide from 27 yards out before Vine Rakin on the other end puts it wide also from about 27 yards out. Uh, there was a shout for a penalty from the Galaxy, but instead Grindseer actually got, got a book for simulation. 100% the right call. I mean, it was pretty clear that Grindseer died in the box. And this also won't be the last time we're going to talk about how how uh how a referee book a player for simulation because it was another game that that of course has happened and i i definitely will give give prop, props to the referee and well the few time i give props to pro in terms of, of handing these yellow card for simulation because it definitely takes a lot for a referee to try to to show a yellow card for for simulation and i know pro this year has been been trying to crack down in terms of it and so far you know they've de definitely done much better job. I mean, I'm not gonna say that they have done a a, a, a an um, an amazing job because there's sometimes where they are still a little bit inconsistent, where a player dive and they still give it a penalty, or they're not gonna give a yellow card for simulation. But they they've de definitely cracked that down much more than what we've seen in in the last couple of years. Now, uh, th now despite that, uh, in the 61st minute, Williams did flash one wide. On the header and the galaxy was pushing for an equalizer though uh the the timbers almost doubled their lead as jimmy charge shot was actually clear off the line for, by by williams so basically williams on both and not only came close in terms of scoring but also become a become a heroic the defender for the galaxy of clearing that one off the line uh then chicharito missed another opportunity in the back post again that's was literally right on his on his alleyway and you just don't see see chicharito miss miss that often and i mean to see him miss one is even even surprising but to see him miss two that is unlike chicharito to there and that it's also unsurprising that he didn't or it's not surprising the fact that because of, of that that kind of unlike 
like of him missing sit sitters. He didn't get on the score sheet in this game. So uh, Alvarez almost did, but he puts it straight to Ivasic in the 69th minute. And I thought Portland, they were on the ropes a little bit. Like they were looking to just kind of hold, hold on to this one nothing lead. I mean, when you're on the road, yes, you want to, of course, protect a one nothing lead. But that's also so can be a dangerous thing because, you know, you don't want to just kind of hold, hold on for... For, for dear life to, so that you can of course get all, all three points because you know the the home team is going to keep piling the pressure and again the Timbers does have a history of concede, conceding late goals when they're trying to hold hold on for dear life though Aspria did try to finish the game for the Timbers but he puts it wide from close range before William blasts one right right to Ivasic in the 83rd minute but then in the 88th minute the Galaxy finally got the goal that they deserve after all the pressure that they were putting and it's who else but but Dejan Jovalic, who has really picked up the the stack for this Galaxy C team with the way that, you know, this Galaxy C team in these last couple of games have really struggled in terms of goal scoring. And a, a lot of that has to play with the way that Chicharito is really struggling in this season for the mo most part of scoring. But at least Jovalic has p picked up the slack as he scored here from Araujo and Leardown to tie the game up at one apiece. And then Araujo mishit a shot from 10 yards out despite being wide open and it doesn't feel feel like the galaxy were, were just satisfied with a draw and they shouldn't because you're playing at home you want to go for for the three points but unfortunately they weren't able to do so as in the end it ends in a 1-1 draw and the shots in this one 12 shots could be the 11 that the galaxy had five shots on goal for the two that the timbers had five shots off target for the eight that the timbers had one shot that was blocked for the two that the timbers had and possession wise 54 percent possession compared to 46 percent possession that the portland timbers had in this game and i guess you know coming out of this game i don't think either of these teams will be happy because again for the timbers they draw point point points uh by giving up a late goals once again but for the galaxy you know they also draw points at at home even with the the comeback and that they had a lot lot of chances and certainly have a good amount of chances where they 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 should be getting the three points, but because they weren't able to put away those chances, they had to settle for a draw in this game against the Portland Timbers. But now moving on, in terms of the next match, is the Red Bulls versus Toronto FC. So the Red Bulls are starting to kind of become a, a bit of a normal MLS team once again, where they're starting to become kind of a team that can finally win, win at home, but but of course now struggle on the road because remember how I talked about early this season where the Red Bulls can only win on the road but they just tend to unable to win at home and they had that infamous record where they become the first MLS team team hit in hit in league history of winning their their or un, go unbeaten in their first six games but also go winless in their first six game at home well that trend is now now reversed with them now going with a two game winless run on the road and now going on a two-game unbeaten run and a two-game winning streak at home with them taking down TFC in this one. And they actually got the goal scoring er early as in the second minute, uh, Lewis Morgan would score from Token to give the Red Bulls a 1-0 lead. Great delivery that was from John Tokens from the corner, which Morgan rifles that one with his header to give the Red Bulls a 1-0 lead. Uh, though on the other end, Nelson trying to re respond quickly for TFC, but Cornell was able to deny him. Cornell had another good game in this one though uh fernandez did puts it wide from close range in the seventh minute as i thought it was a lively start to this game and that's kind of a rarity because when i watch a lot of red bulls games especially when they play at home they're not known for 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 starting games lively like it usually take a while for for a lot of the these red bulls home games to kind of get going that's not the case in this one i mean it was very really lively and that continued in the 10th minute as Lucinius puts one just wide from long range I mean it's safe to say that Lucinius is is right now now the MVP for the Red Bulls I mean hit him him ever since him coming into the starting 11 he has made a huge difference to, to this attack and it's also no surprise that he also end up on the goal scoring sheet again in this one uh though in the 20th minute Akio did puts it wide from 19 yards out before Nelson flashed it wide from close range and again the game the, the uh, TFC were looking to try to get one back, but then the game kind of become very stop and go, and that there was a lot of rough tackle with a lot of of yellow card that was between both of these teams, and it turns out that remember how I mentioned the 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 chance from Nelson which flashed it wide from close. That was actually the last notable chances that we saw in this first half, as we do had to have time with the Red Bulls leading one nothing. Though in the second half. They would double their lead, and as I mentioned, Lucinius would score 
here and you know when leukemia scored it, it's going to be an absolute banger and this was definitely a, a banger and certainly a goal of the week contention although you know i'll mention throughout this video and also in tomorrow's video there's definitely going to be a lot of goal of the week contention because there was also some really good goal that was scored this week but this is definitely going to be one, one of them and it gives the red bulls a two nothing lead uh deandre kerr did try to get one back but he puts it wide from close range before Cornell had to deny Schaffelberg, who was through on goal there. And yeah, you know, TFC, they were trying to push to try get one back, trying to set up a grandstand finish. But it was all for naught because the Red Bulls would hold on to win 2 nothing in this one. And the shots in this one, 14 shots for the 8 that TFC had. 4 shots on goal for the 3 that TFC had. 5 shots off target for the 3 that TFC had. 5 shots that was blocked compared to 2 that Toronto has. And possession-wise, TFC that does have the better position. 57% possession compared to the 43% possession that the Red Bulls had in this game. But if there's one thing we know about the Red Bulls this season, this team, team still wins without possession. I mean, I, I mentioned they are are i think the lowest amount the lowest possession team in the league th this season and it's just been pro proven in the mo modern game of soccer in the modern game of football you don't need possession to win, win games and the red bulls are definitely proving it this season time and time again being out possessed but still able to come away with all three points and yeah they did exactly that, and for TFC, well, you know, they had a good run in the la last game in terms of finally ending their winless run, but yeah, it's kind of back to the drawing board for, for Bob Bradley team after a relatively lifeless performance and also a performance where they just could not, could not be better in terms of the finishing and drop all three points once again on the road. But now moving on in terms of the next match is Columbus and Charlotte and I mentioned before you know this is probably the first time that Charlotte was act actually fa favorite on a road game and a big opportunity for them to get all three points for the first time in club history well unfortunately they weren't able to do that in this game though they did get their their second row point in franchise history though it probably would be different and they probably would have made history of of getting their first road, road win in franchise history if it wasn't for some goalkeeping howler from, from Christian Kalina, who, you know, it's kind of odd of me saying that Kalina actually made a mi mistake because he's been just so solid for Charlotte and had been one, one of the difference maker for this team. But early on in the first half, uh, Williams did head set, set wide, way high from the corner in the third minute before Etienne uh, puts it wide from close range. I thought it was a promising start from from Columbus that wouldn't last though because in the 10th minute Shinishiki did headset wide from the corner before room denied Shinishiki a uh, shot that took a deflection and Charlotte was coming back into this one though Columbus does get the the lead before halftime as Hatado would score here to give the crew a one nothing lead and this is where I talk about the mistake from from Kalina like I think he, he was you know nowadays with goalkeeper they tend to to like to dribble the ball a little bit but one of the dangers when you're a goalkeeper decide to kind of dribble uh the ball and maybe take on on a an uh, attacker with some fancy move is that you got to make sure you get it right because if you don't get it right you can be in serious trouble and in this case Kalina trying to took on one of the Columbus defender and he did or not the Columbus defender but a, a Columbus attacker and he did a good job get past him but the problem is he took a heavy touch and that ball basically ran right into the path of Hatado, who basically scored one of the easiest goal he would ever score in his career and yeah that gives the Columbus crew a one nothing lead and a rare mistake for for Kalina and certainly a frustrating way for Charlotte to go down before halftime but to their credit they bounced back in the second half and it didn't take long for them to bounce back in the second half as in the 49th minute, Shinishiki would score here to tie the game up at one apiece. Probably the best game that Andre Shinishiki has played for Charlotte FC. And he has definitely made made a lot of difference uh, ever since he, he come, come to the, the Queen City and, and have come to the crown, crown from the Colorado Rapids. But in the 52nd minute, Hatado trying to make make it uh or trying to make it 2-1 and trying to get his second goal to retake the lead for the crew but he puts it wide after the ball was kind of pinball in the charlotte box and you know anytime when the ball is pinball in your own box yeah you're basically asking him to get score on and charlotte is very lucky that hatado did not put that one on target uh anababa then puts a weak header that goes wide as i thought columbus was trying to push to get the lead back uh awful though almost 
almost score against his former team, but he puts that one high. I mean, if he did score against his former team, I have a feeling he's not going to sell it, right? Because, you know, I'm pretty sure crew fans still loves Harrison Afo and that, you know, I know his heart is still with Columbus. So there's no doubt that if that one went in, even if that does give Charlotte a 2-1 lead, I'm pretty sure he, he's going to be immediately just, just not c c celebrate and kind of just pay, pay respect anytime when a player basically score against his former team. That's not always the case. I mean, I've seen pl players have scored against the, their, their former team. And especially as we talk about the next game, uh, one of uh, a player did score against his, his former team to, to get the the winning goal of the game he actually did did celebrate but i think in this case if awful did score there i don't think he would have he would have celebrated knowing that he's been with the columbus group for a very long time before going to charlotte fc this season uh but fast forward to the 82nd minute etienne puts it right to kalina before shinishiki went through on goal and again if he, shinishiki would have put this one one in this was no doubt the best per performance in a Shard FC shirt. Well, actually, did I say that he, this was his best performance? I would say that this was equally his best performance, uh, similar to the one that he, he he made his debut for Shard FC, coming off the bench and scoring a, a a goal in that one. But yeah, if you would have put that one away, this would have been, been e even better with him and grabbing a brace and making history for Shard FC of getting their first ever road win in franchise history. But then on the other end, Williams uh, puts it high from the near post in the sixth minute. So Josh Williams not only started the game with the first opportunity of, of this one, but also finished the game with the last opportunity of this game. So it kind of came full circle for Josh Williams, and that's thing you don't see all, all, often in an MLS game. But in the end, it ends in a 1-1 draw, and the shots in this one, 13 shots committed, 11 that Charlotte has, uh, 4 shots on goal committed, 3 that Charlotte has, uh, 6 shots off target for the 4 that Charlotte has, 4 shots that was blocked for the 3 that the crew has, and possession-wise, 51% possession compared to 49% possession that Charlotte has in this game. And, you know, this might, this will be kind of disappointing for Charlotte. You know, if it wasn't for the goalkeeping howler, they could have made history. I think they will definitely take take the points against a Columbus team that, yeah, the struggle continue for the crew this season. Another their resort at home where they, they, they drop pre precious point. And that's something that they just cannot do if they want to, to make it to the playoffs, knowing that they're not a good road team. But that being said, I am now going to switch board and look at the next four games that happen in terms of the Saturday action. So moving on in terms of the next match is Montreal and Austin. And, you know, this is something we've seen so many times happening this season. And it still kind of defy all logic, but it just always tends to happen. The 10 men always tends to be the better team and able to come out victorious. Uh, after the 90th minute and it happened again in this one in the game between Montreal and Austin where despite Austin played the entire second half down the 10 men they're still able to find a way to score a goal down 10 men and get a much needed one nothing victory against a Montreal side that don't lose at home often though in the first half five minutes in Wayama did head to wide from close range before I thought Montreal was actually on the front foot early in this game uh, Jerusi did blast it high in the 14 minute before in the 19 minute Jerusi puts it just wide from eight yards out and I thought after a slow start Austin kind of got into this game though a lot of that attributed because there was just some poor giveaway from the Montreal backline in in that spell where Austin kind of got themselves back into the game but that being said on the other end Austin themselves also were not doing a good job taking care of the ball and that include the goalkeeper too where Brad Stewart yeah, he almost commit a another howler after uh, he was basically kick, trying to kick this one up the field, and it was partially blo blocked by Kai Kamara. And this will be the first time we we we've seen Br Brad Stuver uh, this season in terms of almost committing a goalkeeper howler and also committing a goalkeeper howler because I feel like Brad Stuver is kind of one of those goalkeeper that we know he's an excellent shot stopper and he's definitely one of the goalkeeper that is kind of in the above average reign in MLS but there's also time he makes some of the most boneheaded decision and this was one that that almost cost him and in fact just one minute after a near disaster a near another near disaster happened in the Austin back line as Jimenez actually clear clear a a shot that was blocked by his own teammate Cascante and that one actually redirected toward the net and I mean row Austin was playing with fire at the back like with all these defensive miscue if they keep continuing to to do do that it's going to come come back to to bite them now thankfully they did cut kind of stop those defensive miscue after 
to almost disastrous play in the, the back line by this Austin defense. Uh, and Stuver actually didn't make a good save to deny Kamara from, from the corner in the 28th minute. But then in the 44th minute, Austin's chance of winning this game looked like like was going to be slim after uh, Pereira, of course, gets his second yellow card and Austin was down to 10 men. And even though I said said, said that, um, you know, you you know what I, I, I said before of how, you, even though theoretically teams that go down to 10 men, they they have a dramatic less chances of winning the game. Uh, this season, it's been proving otherwise. It's been proven that time and time again, there's been so many games where the 10 men tends to be the better side. Though, it's not always the case, and I'll talk about in tomorrow's game where there was one game that, that uh, a team went down to 10 men, and yeah, it, did not, it, it didn't go, go in, in their favor as we've seen so many times with teams going down to 10 men. But we do head to half time scoreless between both of these teams. And in the second half, uh, Milijevic flash did wide from close range before Stuver absolutely robbed Kamar from close range. And that, you know, Montreal, knowing that they were a man up, they were looking to try to to press for the opening goal. And I thought once again, they came out the, the interval strong as Austin was coming out slow out of the gate once again, like they did in the first half. But just like the first half, they got themselves in to the game eventually. And Fagunas actually... Went through on going. This was probably the best opportunity of the night up to that point. Uh, as I mentioned, Fagundes going through on going and struck the post. But then nine minutes later, Austin would take the lead. And it's the former Montreal player, Maxi Uruti, would score from Gallagher to give Austin a one nothing lead. I mean, you know, Uruti, since he's kind of started to become a little bit of a journeyman being with so many teams. Now, I think you could, could say that, you know, even when he does score against his former team I think you can say he has the right to just celebrate because of how many teams has been been on and another thing I would also say about Ruti is that he tends to love to score against his, his former team and this was another another one of the team that he used to be with Montreal and now he score score now with the with, with the, the the day and give give Austin a one nothing lead though I will say that that all credit has to go to John Gallagher what a pass this was this was a world-class pass that set up a Ruti to put it into the back of the net and give Austin a one nothing lead. And it could have been 2 nothing just four minutes later and probably should have been if Jerusi didn't put away a free header in the back post. Uh, and it was actually pushed away by Brezza. I mean, the way that Jerusi kind of hits that one on the header in the back post, kind of toward, he kind of heads it down and Brezza still had to make a save there. But that's kind of one that Jerusi would love to ha have back. And I feel like he probably shouldn't have hit, hit that one kind of, uh, tore it down and, and just make that one bounce off the ground and in, into the back of the net, but instead maybe should just go with a powerful header to get get past Brezza there because Brezza wasn't get, getting into it if he put a powerful he header there. Uh, Kamara then blasts one into the sand in the 73rd minute, and you know you were thinking maybe maybe Austin was going to try to hold, hold on, on in this, knowing the fact that they were down to 10 men, and in some way they did, but they did a really good job in, in terms terms of limiting the amount of chances that Montreal has had, though uh, Kyoto had a big opportunity in the 86th minute as he whiffs on a shot from a, from close range and Stuber just able to push that one out as it was looked like it was going to tr trigger to the right side of the post. And I also wrote all hands on deck for Austin because they need to, to keep this defensive discipline if they're looking to try to secure this one nothing thing w when knowing Montreal is going to really push man forward. And in the end, they did exactly that as they were able to hold on to win one nothing in this one. And the shots in this one, 11 shots for the 5 that Austin had. Both teams had 2 shots on goal. 3 shots off target for the 7 that Montreal has. No shots that was blocked for the 2 that Montreal has. And possession-wise, 62% possession compared to 38% possession that Austin has. And oh, also, you know how I said Montreal is a team that, that has been relatively good this season at home? That actually isn't really that true because they have lost a couple of home home resort i think this is what their fourth home loss that they had so they're actually had i take that back why i said that that they, they have been very good at home that's kind of one of the things that they kind of struggle uh, a little bit and also it seems like ever since they go on that club record eight game on bean streak they have definitely came back down to earth but you know for austin they desperately need needed this one because like i said you know the the writing were on the wall that this team was a pretender and that they can't beat it, these these tough opponent and that I think this is also another game that they can send the message to the the rest of the league and all those those doubters that that is doubting Austin 
in terms of being a competitive team, despite the fact that they, you know, a lot of people are still saying that they only got to this point because of a paper thin schedule and that, yeah, you know, they did get their second wins during this tough stretch, but they, they still need to do do much more in, in terms of getting into competitive edge. But, you know, at least we're also they maybe send a message in, in, in this one and let's see if they can continue you to, to build up of this big victory uh, against a really decent team in the East that is Montreal. But now moving on, in terms of the next match, is Orlando versus Houston. And I'll tell you what, Orlando tried their best to, to actually blow this late in this game because Houston were all over Orlando late in this one, especially after they got a goal back. And I thought for sure that the Dynamo was going to find a way to get an equalizer. In fact, they actually did score the equalizer. And then unfortunately, the flag did not I buy them, and actually, I kind of spoiled it a, little, a little, little bit in terms of what happened in that incident. I'll, I'll get to talk about when th th that happened. But early on in the first half and four minutes in, Kara did head it straight to Clark before uh, there there was... Uh, oh, at, in the seven minute, Bear hits one straight to Galese, and I thought both teams was kind of trading shots on goal, but both goalkeeper hasn't really been, been tested. I mean, those were just relatively weak shot for both goalkeeper to kind of practice to, to catch the ball and just register save on their stats line. But we did get the opening goal in the 26th minute, and it's Kara that score from Torres to give Orlando City a 1-0 lead. Great ball that, there from Torres. And it's not very often that we, we've seen our Kara this season able to be shown his clinical finishing, but he definitely shown it in, in this play and give Orlando City a 1-0 lead. And there was no doubt that they that, that gave momentum for Orlando because they started to dictate the game and really... Really, we're looking to try to get that second goal. Uh, though, though they had an opportunity to do so in the second minute of stoppage time, as originally there was a penalty that was given to Orlando after Zeka handballed that one. And while there was no doubt that Zeka handballed it, it, it uh, in that play, the problem is that was outside the box. And originally they said it was inside the box, but when you go to VAR, it is pretty clear that Zeka was out outside the box when he handballed that one. So a fortunate break for for Houston there. Though, uh, on that ensuing free kick, Clark did have to make a great save to den deny Kara on the free kick as Orlando, Orlando almost scored, scored either way, even though they were denied a penalty. But we do had to have time with Orlando leading one nothing, And in the second half, Clark did deny Urso from, from 12 yards out as Orlando continued to push for the second goal. Uh, Rodriguez did put it wide from close range for, for Houston as, once again, both of these teams were treating shots coming out of the interview and little do we know that they would tra be trading goals uh very soon because in the 58th minute Kara would score his second goal of the game from Pereira to give Orlando City a 2-0 lead and before Orlando has a chance to celebrate a multiple goal lead they immediately go, go on the other end to concede one because just one minute after that goal uh Sebastian Fierro would score from Zeka to make it 2-1 in favor of Orlando City and that is one that you know not only it's kind of a classic schoolboy air of Orlando, you know, there's the old saying, you, you're always the most vulnerable when you when you score score a goal, and they definitely kind of switched off there. But also Galese, yeah, he should have done done better in 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 ter terms of uh, of this play, and that there's been a couple of 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 goals that Galese have given up late, lately that you kind of had to question. Qu qu question in terms of the fact that I mean I'm not denying that Galese is still a great goalkeeper. But he's been letting some soft ones, and that is one of those ones that, that, you know, he definitely would, should have done better in terms of that sequence. But in the 68th minute, um, uh, Orlando almost made it 3-1, and it wasn't because they they one of their players scored a goal. It was actually Houston almost scored an own goal as Teenage Hadabi. Uh, he must be thanking the, the post here because he almost scored an own goal, goal here that was struck off the post. I mean, I think that's the first time I've seen this season where a a defender basically tried to score an own goal and it was saved by the post. I mean, not, that doesn't happen very often, but when that happened, I'm pretty sure that defender is definitely kissing the post, thanking, thanking it for, for an embarrassing moment there. But in the 65th minute, Quintero also struck the post on the free kick. So a couple of posts that, that's been hit in a span of just five minutes. Uh, Galese then denied pa Pasher from the right angle and Houston was sort of pressed for an equalizer and this is where I said you know Orlando they were trying their damn damn best in terms of giving up this 2-1 lead and that they they looked like they were just just trying to pack it in even though you shouldn't be doing that that when you're playing 
playing at home and especially against a dynamo team that well there is there are still a team that struggle on the road this season i've seen this season that they have improved on the road and they were really pressing for this equalizer uh they were pressing so much that galese had to deny pasture from the from long range i thought tyler pasture made a great impact coming off the bench uh was unlucky not scoring a goal here uh seren then missed high from long range and then pato trying to finish it for orlando with a rare opportunity ever since since uh, Orlando made it two nothing, but he puts that one wide, and then Olferson actually tried to draw a penalty, but instead getting getting booked for a simulation again, similar to the one I met, mentioned earlier. This was pretty o obvious that Olferson was tr trying to to dive there to maybe maybe uh, draw a penalty, but you know the referee was having none of it. He immediately booked him for simulation. Uh, though Olferson did strike a low shot shot from from close close range that was with a lot of power but that one that one go go straight to uh Galece. before in the fifth minute in a stoppage time it looked like houston got the equalizer as quintero looked like he he scored the tying goal in the in the last kick of the game but unfortunately there was an off offside call and i think it was him that was in an offside position when he scored that goal or was it on the attacking sequence either way it was an all offside and yeah that is got to be heartbreaking for for Houston knowing that they thought that they salvaged a point in this game and they probably should have deserved a point with the way that they really play play well in in this one but ultimately Orlando again despite them trying their best to, to blow this lead they hold on to win 2-1 in this one and the shots in this one 18 shots for the 13 that Houston had six shots on goal for the five that Houston had six shots off target for the five that Houston had six shots off block for the three that Houston has and possession wise 46 percent possession compared to four 54 percent possession that the dynamo has in this game and you know while this is a win for orlando city uh this is definitely not going to be be one that's going to be 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 happy with with the uh, the lions supporters because again it was an ugly ugly win against a, a te team that they, they should be able to beat but at least they're back on on winning form which means that if we go with the orlando city theorem or the inconsistent scene form that they've been going for this season they're probably going to be due for for a loss in the next game but now moving on, in terms of the next match, is the Pat Nolan Derby between the Philadelphia Union versus FC Cincinnati. Or you could also say this is the Chris Albright Derby because Chris Albright, you know, before going to Cincinnati, becoming the sporting director, he was working very close with the Union front office. And in the end, it ends in a 1-1 draw in this one. And early on in the third minute, Carranza hits it straight to Salatano as I thought the Union start out the better side. Uh, the first shot for Cincinnati came as Imbodo shot goes straight to to Blake. But then in the 17th minute, Bedoya would score for Carranza to give the Union a 1-0 lead. What a golazo that was from, from Ali Bedoya. The the way that he basically just just kind of curl, curl. Well, not really curl that one, but hits it with so, so much fin finesse from outside the box. So basically puts it in. And I think that is definitely going to be... One that is going to be a goal of the week contention, along with many goal of the week contention that we've seen from this week. But yeah, that gave the Union a one nothing lead. Though, uh, since he almost equalized just six minutes later, if it wasn't for Blake denying Barrio in the back post. Uh, Cameron's shot then was crucially blocked away in the 33rd minute. As Cincinnati was get, not only getting into this game, but they were pressing for an equalizer. And they did get the equalizer in the 39th minute. As Brendan Vasquez would score from Tyler Blackett to tie the game up at one apiece. But Brendan Vasquez definitely had to pay the price for scoring that. Because uh, when he went down on the ground, uh, I think Blake leg actually caught Vasquez there in the head. So, yeah, that was kind of a hold, hold, hold your breath moment if you're a Cincinnati fan. Because we know how Brendan Vasquez has been such a big impact for the Cincinnati team. And even getting U.S. men's national team consideration and the last thing Cincinnati want to see is their 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 main number nine uh injured because of, of a concussion but the good news is Brandon Vasquez was able to continue for the rest of the game uh Carenza did try to give the union the lead back but he fires one into the side netting in the 45th minute as we had to half time one apiece between both of these teams and the second half uh Barrio hits one straight to Blake before he would fire a long range range effort but also go to to Andre Blake as I thought Cincinnati were were starting the second half the the better side although then we did get a long stretch up period where there were a lot of bunch of yellow card and both teams started to kind of become 
come physical. I mean, there was some 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 rough challenges between both of these teams. But remember, this is gonna be derby matches with the way way that you know you know a lot of of these Cincinnati front front office members, especially the head, head coach, come from from the union. So you know there might be a little bit bad blood in in terms of that, and hence why we saw a lot of yellow card doing that sequence. But that being said, in the 73rd minute, Gastet hit one straight to San Antonio from 10 yards out. I mean, Daniel Gastet would love to have that one back. And especially of how good he's been been, been this season. Uh, a 10-yard yard shot from close. Most of the time, he would bear, bury that one. But he hits that one right to Roman Salatano. Uh, Carenza then put a weak, weak one one right to San Antonio. As, you know, Carenza kind of had an okay game. It wasn't the best. Best performance for him, though. Uh, Gastet would once again had another opportunity, but he once again hits it straight to Santano. Though the Union was definitely trying to press to get the lead back, though uh, Cincinnati were looking to try to get the steal late in this one as Vasquez almost stole it and scored his second goal of the game for Cincinnati, but he puts it why why uh, with a shot in the the back post and yeah in the end it ends in honors even in this one 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 draw shots in this one 13 shots played to 17 that Cincinnati has both team had five shots on goal three shots off target for the four that Cincinnati has five shots that was blocked for the eight that Cincinnati has and possession wise 55 percent possession compared to 45 percent possession that both team has so you know in the Pat Nonan slash Chris Albright Derby it end it ends all square and both teams swore spoil uh the point in this one but overall it was an in inter entertaining game and there's no doubt that anytime when you you have a game that ends in a draw the road team will be always most of the time be the happier side and i think for cincinnati they'll be ha happy to walk away with a point where the union i mean they they really are starting to becoming like the nashville of of this season with them drawing a lot of games this season i think this is like their eighth draw of the season which leads the league and you know it's great to of course draw draw some of the these games but also sometimes straw doesn't doesn't always help you especially at home where you know when you're at home you need to pick up all three points and the union will be very frustrated that they weren't able to do so in this game against cincinnati but now moving on in terms of the next match is going to be the chicago fire and dc united and for the fire the long winless run is finally over. So coming into this game, they had a 10-game winless run, which was the longest active winless run in the league. But that is now all over after them getting a 1-0 win against DC United. And in some way, I think they deserve this win because I think they were by far the better team. But as it is the case this season for the Fire and the reason why they haven't done well this season, they've really struggled to score goals and, and their finishing hasn't been very good. And this was another example of it where they had a lot of chances should have won this more than two or three nothing but you know as the old saying goes beggars can't be be choosers and right now for the fire knowing how bad that this season ha has gone they'll take it the fact that they can get all free free points in this with a one nothing victory now early on in the ninth minute uh the first shot of the game came in the ninth minute as Almsberg puts it wide on the header as I thought Chicago started the better side despite the limited chance uh Mueller then heads it wide on the header before DC did have their first big opportunity as Birnbaum missed a free header from 14 yards out that was a golden opportunity for for Steven Birnbaum and one that he definitely would love to have that one back with, with the way that you know when you get a free header and you're a center back from 14 yards out that that's when 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 the the your eye lit up and that and that that is also sometimes that you just need to put it away if you are a defender giving that opportunity uh Romo then denied Gutierrez from from close range Romo had a great game in, in in this one and probably was one of the big reason why this one was keep at nil nil for a long time uh Mueller then ha had a a cross shot ki kind of, of moment that almost hit the post or I would like to say he kind of tried to do a random layout there but unfortunately it the post denied him uh Romo then denied Gutierrez who was through on goal I mean Brian Gutierrez had a lot of opportunity early in this game and I thought overall he had a good game in this one but he'll be frustrated that he didn't get on the score sheet with the amount of chances that he had but one thing we do know is that the fire was pushing for the opener Shabilko heads it high from close range in the 35th minute before Jimenez puts one straight to Romo as we head to halftime scoreless despite the amount of chances that the fire was getting in the first half and that would continue in the second half though not before Birnbaum had another opportunity to head that one in but he he puts that one wide uh Romo then denied Jimenez on the free kick and like I said Romo's he 
feel like it, he was on top of his game, and this was by far the best game that he has played in a DC United shirt, even though it's only, I think this is only his second start during, during uh, his, his tenure with DC United, and his first start was definitely not one that he wants to rem remember, but he definitely had a great game game in this one and i would also say that not only he, he he was performing well and preventing the the fire from from scoring but it also you got to say that it's a combination of the fire continue to have problem in term terms of finishing uh jimenez then puts it wide from long range in the 64th minute before taxi funtes puts it just high from long range and you know after all the hypes about taxi funtes yeah that hype has kind of started to die down because i don't think he has scored a goal ever si since uh his third game of the season though in the 78th minute after all the opportunity the fire has they finally were able to capitalize and it's fabian herbert scoring a rare goal here from shabelko to give the fire a one nothing lead i mean i don't remember the last time that fabian herbert scored a goal there but the fire will definitely take it as they lead it one nothing uh funtas try, trying to tie the game game up for dc just four minutes after the fire got the lead but he puts that one wide on the back post and yeah that was really the only the other action in this game as the fire pretty much locked down this game for the last eight minutes despite only holding a slim one nothing lead and like i said that was the final score of this one shots in this one 14 shots for the 11 that dc had seven shots on goal for the none that dc had seven shots off target for the eight that dc had no shots that was blocked for the three that dc had and possession wise 53 percent possession compared to the 47 percent possession that dc united has in this game and like i said for the fire they desperately need, need needed this game and that if they can just fix their 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 finishing problem and at times they they their 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 final dirt problem that they kind of still had in this game there's no doubt that they can can start to to dig themselves out of the hole because when you look at this team this is a de decent team if they can figure figure the attack a little bit then in in this in this team and again if they can do, do that maybe they can start to get themselves out of the hole because when you look at the the standings in the the eastern conference even some of the worst team in the league are still in the the playoff race so yeah you know we'll see see whether or not if the fire can finally start to go on on a good run like they did in the beginning of the season but for dc it is safe to say that 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 new new uh coaching boost or the interim co head coach boost from Ch chad ashton taking over from from um from her and lasada is now complete complete gone and that you know that's the thing about new new head coach or new interim term coach boost where you know it, it can can give you good reserve in the first couple of games but then it qu can quickly wear off if the other team started to know what that interim head coach is going to do and by the way this won't be the last time i'll talk talk about how how an an interim head coach that took over the team and started to perform well and then in the last couple of games it has not been that case but that being said, I am now going to sports board one more time and look at the last two games that happened in terms of the Saturday action. But moving on in terms of the next match is probably the most surprising resort in terms of the Saturday action, but not the most surprising resort in terms of match week number 15 because as I'll talk about tomorrow in terms of looking at those Sunday game, there was one game in the Sunday game that I don't think anybody saw it coming. In terms of the resort and we're probably one of the biggest surprise thing resort of this season but this one yeah i don't think a lot of people saw this one coming with vancouver able to go on the road and only getting their second victory on the road this season against fc dallas especially with the way that this is the same white caps team that just a couple of days ago they got absolutely destroyed by the seattle sounders for nothing in that one and i've even said in the preview it's going to take some something Thing very very dramatic for them to to able to bounce back from that top resort where they just look like they me mentally checked out and then you realize that the Whitecaps also have Vanny Sartini and I'll tell you what whatever Vanny Sartini said to to this team it worked per perfectly because they really play a perfect role game against FC Dallas and while some might say that it was kind of a smash and grab resort when you also look at the stats of this game this was more indictment in terms of FC Dallas just could not put the the ball in the back of net, even if their their life depends on because of how atrocious the finishing was from them. Now early on, and it kind of helped the fact that you can have a chance to win a road game when you score early in in a game, and that's exactly what the Whitecaps did. As in the second minute, 
Cavallini was able to score to give the Whitecaps a one nothing lead, but it was just calamity defending from Dallas. Like the fact that that ball ball somehow still was able to to get through Cavallini despite there was a couple of Dallas defender has a chance to clear it. Yeah, that that's just not great defending whatsoever from from Dallas and Cavallini took full advantage of that, giving the Whitecaps a one nothing lead. Though Vancouver did start to drop their lines as what we expect them to do coming into this game and decided to let Dallas had all the possession and tried to counter. Uh, Pass did, did deny Kuba a shot from, from long range and pushed that onto the post. And again, despite the fact that Dallas looked like they, they were going to dominate the possession and that, well, you know, yes, it seems like they got off to a slow start. But, you know, they're going to come back from the, this game and maybe start their press for the equalizer. And then you you, you just saw, saw what I mentioned, the fact that Pass all, almost... Or Vancouver almost got the second goal if it wasn't for Pass making an incredible save and push that one onto the post. Now, that being said, on the other end, Cropper did deny Fira on a 1-1 one one in the 14 minute. Little do we know that that actually is the only shot on goal that Dallas would have throughout this entire game. Uh, but Ariola then puts it wide from 22 yards out before Fira blasts it high as Dallas was looking to equalize her. But this also is the, the, the part where... Where in this early bid where they were, were missing chances left and right. That kind of just sums up Dallas night. Because in the 44th minute, uh, just as Dallas thought that maybe they could get themselves the equalizer before halftime. Vancouver would double their lead. And it's Caicedo with a great free kick goal to give the Whitecaps a 2-0 lead. I would also maybe say goal of the week with a question mark. Though, you know, there was a couple of free kick goals that were, were scored this week so you know i think there's going to be some some big competition especially with some of the the goals that i've also mentioned that is non-free kick goal that i would say is also considered a goal of the week contention but yeah that gives the whitecaps a a two two nothing lead heading into halftime and it just feels like dallas was once again find themselves in a similar situation they were against minnesota where i feel like this game was similar to the game against minnesota where just like how they, they went down two two no nothing and the fact that yeah their finishing was just just not there even as as much as they was trying to create some some chances uh there was a shout for a penalty for dallas in the 58th minute that was not given though not much really happened in the first 15 minute which favored vancouver uh hara then puts it just high from close range before Ariola heads it wide from close range and i immediately wrote just feel like it's not going to be dallas night with the the lack of finishing that would continue this into the 74th minute as Vera missed white from close range and then Hara puts it high with high uh with an overhead kick I mean that would have been a spectacular effort if Franco Hara would score there but it was not meant to be and that also kind of kind of summarized how Dallas weren't able to to get a resort and were kept off the the score sheet as in the end you know they despite they had 16 shots in this game compared to just four that Vancouver has only one of them was on target and how many times I've, I've said before you you can put 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 as much shot as possible on the stat sheet but if you can only get one of them on target compared to the 16 that dallas had yeah it's a heavy indictment that you are definitely just shooting from everywhere or you're not showing your clinical finishing which we saw a lot of that from dallas in this game uh two shots off target for the nine that dallas had six shots out block for the none that vancouver has and possession wise 67 percent possession compared to 33 percent possession that the white caps has in this game but like i said you know what a bounce back this is from the the Vancouver Whitecaps, and again it helps when you have Vanny Sartini, who who is probably the the most charismatic big manager now that we ha have in MLS ever since Almeida, of course, le left and got fired from from the Quakes, but certainly one that will will continue this relatively good run that the Whitecaps has been on. But for FC Dallas, yeah, these last couple couple of games it has not got gone to plan and you just wonder you know especially some of these guys that that did well in the early season guys like Ariola and Velasco has really sh struggled with their team and even Jesus Ferrer himself has started to struggle for Dallas yeah things have, have are, are started to take a little turn from the worst and unless if those guys doesn't doesn't pick things up this team can can find them themselves dropping being down the western conference table very very soon because you know the western conference is very competitive and that if you keep keep dropping points and if you go on on a downward spiral you can easily find find yourself self below the the red line despite the fact that for more most of the year it looked like dallas was going to to compete and right now they're just hitting a very rough patch of form 
But now moving on in terms of the next match and the last match in terms of this video and the Saturday action is RSL versus the San Jose Earthquakes. And yeah, this looked like it was a throwback Quakes road game back in the Dominic Kinnear era. And anytime when I me mention anything related to Dominic Kinnear and the Quakes being on the road, yeah, most likely it's not a good thing. And it wasn't because this was probably one of the worst road performance and easily the worst road performance I've seen the Quakes play this season where they basically just show no heart, no fight throughout the entire 90 minutes and you you could even say that they they were basically just a no-show in this game against rsl and this is probably the easiest three points that rsl would have got against the quakes team that just decided to not not show up at the the this game whatsoever now in the second minute uh glad did have the first opportunity but he missed a header from close range before it obviously puts it into row z from long range uh early on though i thought the build-up was promising from for the quakes but that's all the positive thing i would say about the quakes at least for this game because one they were giving way too much space on the defensive end for rsl to operate and not to mention even though the build-up was promising the final third was once again the problem for the quakes in this game though obviously did have a big opportunity from 15 yards out but he missed miss high there in the 19 minute that turns out to be a, be a costly miss for obviously and for the quakes because just three minutes later uh, Marcel Silver would score from Savarino to give RSL a 1-0 lead. It was a monster night for Jefferson Sa Savarino. And also, uh, he would get on the score sheet for the first time since returning with RSL on his second stint. But this also came from a corner. And you know how the Quakes are, are, are always considered one of the worst teams in terms of th defending corner. I mean, to the Quakes' credit, in these last last year or so they have done a much better job do so because i remember back in 2020 they were leading the league in terms of the most goal can see from a corner and i always say that that's an achilles heel and it feels like this old achilles heel is back from the quakes because yeah that was not great defending for for the quakes on on that corner and that you just cannot let mark marcelo silver wide open there in the 18 yard box and not expect to, to potentially get score on Although, just eight minutes later, Marcinkowski would rob Rubin from close range, and RSL had all the momentum up to that point. Like, as soon as that, that opening goal was scored, the Quakes basically che checked out. And this is also where I, I go back to what I said, said, said that this is, looks feels like, like the old Dominic Kinnear, or even the 2017 or 2018 kind of Quakes team, where as soon as they give up one goal on the road, it's game over. Uh, then, in the first minute of stoppage time, Savarino thought that he scored... Hit, his his first goal since returning from RSL and scoring the second one, but the goal thankfully was disallowed for offside as we had to have time with RSL leading one nothing. Could have been two nothing straight off the bat when Marcinkowski with a great double save to rob both Rubin and Cordova. Uh, Savarino then hits it sits straight to Marcinkowski again. Savarino ever since he came back from RSL he has been very lively and it's it's almost like he has has a point to prove that he. He, he's a guy that maybe RSL shouldn't have let, let him go in the first first place. And I think RSL fans are probably happy the fact that he, he did return. And I even wrote that RSL kind of picked up where they left off, which is continued to dominate this game and creating some good opportunity. But I also thought the Quakes also picked up where they left off here in the second half, which is being completely flat on the attack and being, being absolutely atrocious in the defensive area. In fact, you know, talk about how the attack being very flat. 55 minutes in. The Quakes have zero shots on goal compared to five that RSL had up to that point. And in fact, they would only finish this game with just one shot on goal. Uh, because after Cordova heads it high from close range in the 70th minute, the only shot on goal came in the 76th minute. And it wasn't even a difficult save from McMath. I mean, it was just a one hopper from Jan Gregorich that goes straight to McMath. And then just six minutes later, Savarino would get on the score sheet to give the RSL a 2-0 lead again. You know, this could be a goal of the week contention because of the way that Savarino you know, does a great job bringing this one down and ba ba basically hits that one per perfectly. But you also not, not only have to question the Quakes defense, but you also got to question what in the world is Jackson Yu doing there. In fact, I probably should have wrote Savarino score uh, and... And he scored from, from you there because you basically provide an assist for Savarino. Like, the way that he basically hits that one. I don't know if Jackson, you realize that he's played for, for the Quakes and instead of RSL because, yeah. You know, you talk about, about players that ha have scored own goal and forgot that he played for his team. 
this is a case where 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 you just forgot that he's played for the Quakes because he basically just headed straight into the path of of Sabarino, and next thing you know, RSL were leading two nothing in this game. Now in the 88th minute, the Quakes did have an opportunity to get get one back, which again this would have been been similar to the 2017 or 2018 Quakes, where they always tend to 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 nick one back to give us false hope, but the post of course denied Nathan to do so, and then in the 90th minute, Miram put. Puts it wide from close range, try to put the cherry on top. But in the end, RSL with a convincing 2 0 win over the Quakes. Shots in this one 16 shots for the seven that the Quakes had, six shots on going for the one that the Quakes had, five shots off target for the seven that Real Salt Lake has, one shot that was blocked for the three that RSL had, and possession wise 66% possession compared to 34% possession that RSL has in this game. And yeah, I think it's also safe to say that the honeymoon period with Alex Cavallo in the interim head coach. Is officially over, and I've also so would like to say that I predicted that this to happen. Where you know when the when they were on a great great run a couple of uh, weeks ago, or even just last month when the Quakes were red hot. The reason why I I wasn't very po positive, and I know maybe some would would say say I was being very ne negative and being too pessimistic, is because I've seen this before. I've seen the Quakes go on a good run. But then, then the good run tends to be, be false hope. And that even though this team was getting close in terms of making the playoffs, I repeatedly said that they, they weren't going to make it because I know the drop is going to, to, to happen. And I know that, you know, with with how I've seen in, in the league with interim head coach, usually they, they come into the league and do well with the team, but it, it doesn't last long. And it seems like that is the case now where, you know, I think for Ellis Carvalho, well, he has definitely done some good things with this this Quakes team, uh, I, I still still think that he's just kind of out of it, his depth, and that there is no doubt that the Quakes are are working, working hard in terms of finding a a heck their next head coach. But also, this is why I've, I've said that this is kind of a throw, throwaway year for the Quakes, and that this is also for the rest of the season. I think think they just need to kind of take a look to see what has gone gone wrong in this team. And I would say that maybe maybe the defense defense is kind of a problem, but now it seems like the goals have started to dry dried up for this team or at least in some way i feel like this this attack at time it, it, it's been kind of inconsistent because i've seen them do well at times and then there's some sometimes like in this game and also in the previous game against nashville where they just completely look look lackluster so that's kind of maybe something that they might might also look into but at the end of the day i think we know what the main priority is for this quakes team and they can even even fix this as soon as the summer and that is they need to bring more defensive reinforcement. Like this defense is is by far the worst defense in the league. And it even shown in terms of the stats with them giving up the most goal. And that's not going to, to change unless that they, they they find find something to cha change that. But either way, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys see a like, smash the subscribe button. Let me, let me know in the comments below what do you think of these two games and also the eight other games that I mentioned before in this video but until then hope you guys enjoyed this video and i will see you guys next time